See if I can keep time as I preach, right? Hey, so uh, if you have not grabbed one, sorry, I got some props today. If you have not grabbed one, uh, on the side tables uh, are some notebooks, blue notebooks that uh, are sermon notebooks. There's also pens over there. Uh, please, if you don't have one, you want to go grab one today. To, in my opinion, today's one of those days uh, where I'm going to explicitly ask you guys to take notes, right? Uh, normally, it's, you know, it's kind of up to you on, on what you want to do, but the topic we're going to cover today, uh, I, I want I want to see tops of heads some. So if you don't have one, don't be shy. Just walk over uh, and grab one. So other by way of other announcements, uh, the leftover chocolate bars from Father's Day, you have to take them because I eat one every time I come down here. Uh, so after church, you may come up and get one, right? I want them gone. Uh, one apiece. So that, breakdown, we do not have to do today. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, right? We got to do it one more time next week for VBS, and then we're done for a while. Uh, but no breakdown today. Uh, and speaking of VBS, it starts like next Monday, not tomorrow, but the following Monday. Uh, so if you've got any last-second donations, like off the donation board back there, we need to get those turned in pretty quickly. Uh, it's pretty full right now. We've got about 100 kids that are going to be here from, from preschool up through uh, fifth grade, right? Sixth grade? Oh, goodness, sixth grade. Going into sixth grade. Uh, so lots of kids. You'll see decorating this week. If you go back there, you'll already see some going on. There's a mission team that's coming up here from Hunter Street Baptist Church. Uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, they're bringing uh, around seven or eight people that are going to be helping us with that. So they'll be worshiping with us next Sunday. Uh, lots of stuff going on for, for VBS. Uh, youth, you guys should have gotten, uh, and well, not you personally, probably your parents, right? Because we don't really trust you with information yet. But um, your parents should have gotten an email with lots of stuff going on for youth this summer. Uh, there's, you know, uh, Friday, this coming Friday, you've got your end of year cookout. For those that are helping with VBS, there's kayaking on the following Friday. There's a Tuesday book club and Bible study. There's the 30-hour famine, which is coming up later uh, this month. And then there's a lock-in in August, right? You guys have got a busy summer. So uh, get, your, get your calendars kind of ready. All right? All right. Here we go, right? As I'm sure you're probably aware, uh, the Supreme Court issued a ruling a couple of weeks ago. Yes, 6-3 ruling. Uh, that overturned the Roe v. Wade case that was passed in the early 70s and returned abortion legislation, really, to the states uh, and back, really, into the discussion. Uh, you probably also, know, if, you, if you've been here long enough, you'll have heard me say, right, one of the decisions that you have to make when you go into ministry uh, is how often do you pause what you're planning to do and talk about something that's happening out in the wider culture? Uh, and different pastors take different tracks on this. Some do it quite frequently. Uh, some do it quite rarely. I, I tend to be a little bit more on the, the rare side. As I thought back over the last eight and a half years since I've been here, uh, this is really the fourth time that it's happened. It happened with the Obergefell ruling, right, on marriage. Uh, paused briefly for George Floyd, another for the Capitol riots, and here we are now with what we'll call the Dobbs ruling. Uh, I don't necessarily believe it's my job to always pause and, and tell you guys and kind of relate to you guys what's going on in the culture, right? My job is to bring to you, here's what the word of the Lord says, and that's really kind of it. But there are moments from time to time where we do need to pause. So we're actually going to take this Sunday and, and next Sunday and talk about this issue because it, it's a big one. Uh, and it's one that, that is going to be in the national conscience and national topics for a long time. And I want to approach this uh, with a couple of things in mind. One is, is we want this to be a grace-filled conversation. This is a sensitive topic. Uh, there are many people that have been affected by it. Uh, people in this room, right? People that you know that have had one, or perhaps a child has, or a friend has. So we want to approach it with a lot of grace and great kindness. I also want it to be truth-filled, right? We want to see clearly. We want to understand truthfully. We want to be able to speak truthfully. John 1.14 uh, says, you know, Jesus was the Word, was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and he was full of both grace and truth. We need to interact and to speak with both of those. 
we want to do this redemptively, right? We want to change hearts and influence minds and hearts. I have no interest in stoking controversy. While we may, what we talk about may be controversial, and our point is, what does the Lord have to say about this particular topic? So the structure of kind of what we're going to do here, it's, it's really, if you look at it, like one 90-minute sermon probably. But I don't know that I can get away with 90 minutes on one Sunday, so I've chopped it in half. And we're going to do half today, and half next is probably not going to be 45 minutes. Some of you guys are going, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> I got somewhere to be. Probably not going to be 45 minutes, but you get the idea. Uh, we're going to kind of chop it in half. Today, we're going to ask the question, what are the unborn? Okay, and we're going to examine it from several points of view. And the next Sunday, we're going to ask the question, how do we talk about this topic with others and deal with common things that we hear in our culture, my body, my choice, uh, or this is going to get women killed, or things like that. And then we're going to talk about what does the pro-life, really, movement, in my opinion, look going forward on a personal level and perhaps on a state and national level, okay? So that's, that's really how we're going. This is very unusual. Uh, this is not kind of a normal. I was planning on going into a different sermon series, but, but here we are. So we're going to stop and do it. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump in, okay? Lord Jesus, uh, give us grace today. Give me grace today, Lord, as I speak. Uh, pour your spirit within me. Uh, let my words be words that are honoring to you. Father, I pray your spirit is active among our congregation, whether they're in this room or, or they're watching currently, or they may be watching on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or next month. We don't know. Lord, we pray your spirit and your grace among us all. Unstop our ears that we may hear. Unstop our minds and, and clear our minds that we may understand. Lord, soften our hearts that whatever you would have us here will take root there and change. Hide us behind the cross and at the foot of the cross. Pray this all through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you're going to take notes, and I hope you do today, the first question you're going to want to write down, what are the unborn? When it comes to this, this particular topic, uh, you hear all kinds of arguments, okay? Statements on the rightness, on the wrongness, it can be confusing uh, and overwhelming to try to work through them, to even try to understand it all sometimes. And especially to talk with people about the sheer emotions of this topic can be overwhelming and from, from those on the left, from those on the right, from those that perhaps have had one, from those that regret having one, from those that are celebrate the opportunity to have one. Trying to get your footing and navigating this it's not easy. So I want to give you just one simple question that I think helps cut through a lot of the emotion and fog around this. And that question is, what are the unborn? What are they? Are they, in fact, members of the human race or are they not? And there's enormous implications to that question because if they are, right, then destroying them or killing them without proper justification is a great moral wrong. But if they are not, then you need no more moral justification for an abortion than you do to clip your fingernails or pull a tooth. The whole thing hinges on that question. What are the unborn? And I want to look at this today, as I mentioned earlier, from several points of view. And here's the three. We'll go through them in order. I want to look at them through the lens of science. I want to look at it through the lens of reason, or what I'm going to call logic or just thinking. And I want to look at it through the lens of Scripture and church history. We're going to take them in that order, okay? Science, reason, Scripture, and church history. What does science have to say about the unborn? I spent some time over the last couple of weeks, I, I ordered... Uh, I didn't realize this, right? When I went to college, you had to buy textbooks. Now you can rent them. Did you know that? Amazon will rent you textbooks. Uh, so I went out and, and did some searching, right, on textbooks on embryology. If you're not familiar with the study of embryology, right, it is the uh, study of embryos, right, from fertilization to conception to development to birth, right? It's a study of how you get pregnant, what happens after that, nine months, right, till baby is born. I went and did some research. Uh, of, of the most common and widely used embryology textbooks in medical schools. 
uh, and I found a pretty persistent list, a pretty consistent list of the top five, and I picked two. I ordered them from Amazon textbook rental, so I've got these for about a month. Uh, and I wanted to read and confirm, like, when a woman's egg and a man's sperm combine, what is it? So the first one uh, is, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave these up here if you want to take a look at it. It's called Langman's Medical Embryology, 14th edition. Uh, and I'm going to read a passage as you go through it, right? As Full disclosure, I did not read every word in both of these, right? Uh, that's, I already know after having read this, much more than I wanted to know about this process. Uh, <laughs> with diagrams and everything, right? Uh, But here's kind of the summary of chapter three, which is the first week of development, ovulation to implantation, right? Figure 3.12, events during the first week of human development. Oocyte immediately after ovulation, right? Fertilization, approximately 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. Stages of male and female pronuclei. It just kind of goes through, but what I've noticed is over and over and over again, it refers to human development. Okay? Human development. The second one, and I'll put this one down here in case you guys want to take a look at it a little bit later. The second one that I ordered and got Keith Moore, a uh, guy named Prasad Torchy, 11th edition, clinical oriented embryology. It's, the title of it is The Developing Human. The beginning of chapter one, I'm going to read just the first paragraph. Human development is a continuous process that begins when an oocyte from the ovum from a female is fertilized by a sperm, spermatozoan, from a male to form a single-celled zygote. Cell division, cell migration, programmed cell death, differentiation, growth, cell rearrangement, transform the fertilized oocyte, a highly specialized totipotent cell, the zygote, into a multicellular human being. Most development changes occur during the embryonic and fetal periods. However, important changes can occur at later periods in the development. In the neonatal period, the first four weeks, infancy, the first year, childhood, two years to puberty, and adolescence, 11 years and beyond. Do you see what it's saying? Human development. It's customary to divide human development into prenatal before birth and postnatal after birth periods. Right? The science textbooks lay out from the beginning all the way, right, that what we are talking about is a human being. It's a zygote, right? The embryo is not a mature human being yet, or she, but it is a distinct, living, whole human being. It's at the beginning of its life, right? You did not, listen, and here's like, you did not come from an embryo. Right, like, like it's like an egg you hatched out of and you were not part of. You were an embryo. Just like you were an infant or a toddler or a teenager. Right, the embryo or, or the fetus is what you were earlier in your development. You are just simply more developed now than you were then. So I don't, I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on this one because it's simply, to put it very, very bluntly, the science is, is crystal clear, right? It's not debatable. Maybe 50 years ago when Roe was passed, there was some uncertainty. We like the technology. There's been 50 more years of study, but the science is clear now. It's a human being. The unborn are human beings, which really begin, brings us uh, to the second kind of idea. Right? What does reason have to say? What does logic have to tell us about the unborn? Some within uh, the pro-abortion community will will acknowledge uh, that the unborn are in fact human beings, but still advocate for abortion up to a certain point. That point might be something like viability, right? That if the baby can survive outside of the womb, then it becomes morally wrong, right? Or self-awareness. That's another argument, that the baby is aware of his existence or personhood, or perhaps when it can feel pain. There's, there's some line that, that's drawn. Uh, they might agree that it's a human, but somewhere on that zero to 40 week development, it's still morally acceptable to abort. Based on the idea that they might be human, right, but they're not yet a human person. 
personhood is defined by the ability to survive on their own or self-awareness or sense of pain or something like that. And ultimately, the arguments kind of center around the idea of the unborn being human, but they're not valuable humans yet. You with me? And as such, they're expendable. So what do we think about that? Like, how do we think clearly about this? Well, I want to ask you another question. You can write this one down if you like. It's not going to be on the screen. But what's the difference between a human being and a human person? Is there a difference? Every human being is a human person, too. And what we find that most of the arguments that say they're not, they, they, they kind of concentrate around four areas. And I'm going to give you an acronym today that's going to help you kind of think through, like, how do we think through this clearly? And it begins, uh, or the acronym is SLED, like SLED, like you write on a SLED, S-L-E-D. Right, that'll be up there on the screen. We'll get to each of these individually, but the, the acronym stands for size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Okay, they're all going to be up there. You don't have to write them all down now, right? But I like that you're writing stuff down. Size, level of development, environment, dependency. Does a human being transition into a human person at some point as it changes size? From itty-bitty, teeny-tiny, microscopic, you know, one or two cells to grown adult human being. The idea is that the unborn is smaller than a born human, right? It's tiny, sometimes referred to as just a clump of cells. You can't see it. It doesn't look like a human being. But let, I don't know. Let me ask you this, guys. Does a difference in size disqualify you from personhood? Do you ever think about that? Does a difference in size disqualify you from personhood? An NFL offensive lineman is much bigger than the average woman. Should their rights be based on their size? Right? A, a 14-year-old teenager is much bigger than a 2-year-old toddler. Are their human rights differentiated by their size? No. Can we kill the 4-year-old or 2-year-old without justification just because she's smaller? No. Why? Because a human being's value is not based upon its size. Right? In the same way, the unborn is smaller than the two-year-old. But if we can't kill the two-year-old because she's smaller, why can we kill the unborn because they are? The difference in size is not a good reason to destroy another human being. Little human beings are persons, too. And to take that just kind of a step further, I mean, if you think about this, this whole idea of, of, of a difference in size goes against every instinct that we have. Right, we're out of school now, but, but imagine this scenario with me. Imagine you walked onto a school playground, okay? And you find four fifth graders bullying a first grader. What would you do? You'd step in. You'd stop it. Why? Because you recognize the smaller one is less capable of defending themselves. We naturally know that those smaller than us deserve our protection, but somehow in this area, these instincts get flipped on their heads. And the smallest and most vulnerable become the most expendable. Difference in size is not a good reason. That's the S. What about the L? Level of development. That's the L. The idea here is that the unborn is less developed, right? This kind of ties along a little bit with the size. The unborn is less developed than a born human being. But I'm going to ask the same question again. Are your human rights determined based on your level of development? 
A 24-year-old woman's reproductive system is much more fully developed than a six-year-old girl's. Is she more valuable? Right? Should the older, more developed person have more basic human rights than the less developed person? Guys, our value should not be determined by how developed we are. Difference in developmental stage is not a good reason. I was actually reading uh, an, an article this week, right? Because I said this stuff's everywhere and kind of all the time. But it was, uh, it was an article on what's called gradualism, which is a, a moral theology kind of article written by a lady named Amanda Roth, who's associate professor of philosophy, women's and gender studies at the University of New York College in Geneso. I think I pronounced that right. Uh, but she, uh, the, the article kind of argues that, that the row period and, and the religious people kind of put together some bright lines on when it's appropriate and not appropriate to, to be able to abort, right? That under row, it can really almost be, not almost, can be all the way up to birth, right? Uh, but with a lot of religions, she said it goes back to conception. But here's, again, I, I, as I said, this, the article is on a, a philosophy called gradualism. Listen to what she says. She says, gradualism rejects all of this. It holds that there's no such bright line. Instead, the development of moral status parallels the physical, cognitive, and relational development of a fetus. Just after conception, a zygote has little more status than a sperm or an egg. But as the embryo develops, its moral value increases slowly and steadily. You see where she's going with this, right? It's, it's a level of development thing. So thus, while a six or, eight embry six or eight week embryo might have very minimal status, a fetus at 32 or 35 weeks has virtually identical moral status to a newborn. Therefore, the earliest abortion is generally morally unconcerning to someone with a gradualist view, while the third trimester abortion is seen as a grave action that requires the strongest of moral reasons. Meanwhile, mid-pregnancy fetuses are morally, in her quotes, not mine, in between. The idea is that by this point in pregnancy, fetuses have not achieved full moral status, but they certainly have a significant moral value, and ending their lives requires some moral justification. It's a level of development argument, right? But guys, like, who decides when you become a person? Like, who gets to make that decision when it all of a sudden becomes a moral wrong to kill you? Right? And if you can gradually gain your personhood, can you gradually lose it? Like, what happens uh, for those that are dealing with, like, dementia or Alzheimer's? Right? Do you, at some point in that process, cease to become a person? And it becomes okay to terminate you? Like, at, at what point in, in development, going up or going down, are you too dependent to live any longer? Level of development is not a good reason. What about the E, environment? Environment. The unborn is located in a different place. Right, than the born. The born, we are outside the womb. The unborn are inside the womb. Does your location, you can write this question down too, it's not going to be up there. Does your location determine your value? Is someone in New York City more valuable than someone in New Delhi, India? Does your location determine your value? Is someone more valuable in London than in Beijing? Are you more valuable in the International Space Station or 600 feet below the ocean surface in a Virginia-class submarine? Does your value change as a human being depending on where you are? Your value as a human does not change. A human is a human in space or on Earth, underwater or in the air. And it doesn't change whether you're inside the womb or outside the womb. Seven-inch journey down the birth canal does not magically transform a non-human into a human being or into a human person. Where you are located is not a good reason. And here's the last one. Degree of dependency. 
That's the D, S-L-E-D, degree of dependency. The unborn are dependent. They are highly dependent. They are almost completely dependent on the nutrition and safety of their mother's womb. In other words, they, are, they cannot live without it. But you can probably anticipate the question, right? Does degree of dependency disqualify you from being a person? What about newborns? They're completely dependent on moms or dads for everything. Toddlers, we have six-year-olds. They are still completely dependent. What about those in a coma? They're completely dependent upon someone else. What about those on a ventilator because of COVID? They're dependent on someone or something else to keep them alive. Are they no longer persons? What about the elderly? We just talked about them. Dementia or Alzheimer's. They depend on others to take care of them. Do we lose our personhood when we become dependent upon others for our care or survival? And the answer is no. We recognize, but just because someone needs help doesn't mean that they're not valuable persons. The unborn are fully dependent upon their mothers, but in the same way, that doesn't disqualify them from personhood. The degree of dependency is not a good reason. So where are we? Let's pause for a minute. Science tells us, right, that the unborn are in fact human beings. Reason tells us that the unborn are valuable human persons. To treat them differently is in fact another form of discrimination. Think about it, right? At one point, and somewhat continuing even today, our societally heavily discriminated against black people. Right? On what basis? On a physical characteristic, the color of their skin. Yes? What are we discriminating against the unborn? It's a physical characteristic. It's not their skin color. It's how big they are. We discriminated against black people because of a perceived level of development. They were less smart, less development, less evolved. These were the arguments that were used. It's the same argument for the unborn. They're less developed. We discriminated because of their location. They were from Africa, not from Europe. Where their environment was. It's the same argument inside the womb or outside the womb. Church, it's the same thing. It's discrimination based on physical characteristic and level of development and location. Scott Klusendorf, I'm going to introduce you to his book here in, in just a moment. Uh, it's called The Case for Life. He, he says this, this is a quote. Why are sexism and racism wrong? Isn't it because they pick out a surface difference, gender or skin color, and ignore the underlying similarity that we all share? We should treat men and women, African Americans and whites, as equals and protect them from discrimination. Why? Because they all have a human nature. But if the unborn also has that same human nature, shouldn't we protect them as well? Determining the value of a human being based on some characteristic like size or development or location is wrong. It was wrong when we did it in slavery. It was wrong when we do it in sexism. It's wrong now. Okay. Heading into the third thing, where are we, right? We've, we could probably, I mean, in, in, in the realm of kind of, okay, is where, where are we on this? We could probably strike now because there's a couple of strong arguments from science and reason on why we should not support abortion. But we are Christians. We value what the Lord has to say on this topic. What is the Bible what does church history tell us on this? To talk about scripture for a moment. You can write this down. This is kind of the third one, right? You often hear advocates for abortion make the case that the Bible never mentions it. The word is never said. It doesn't prohibit it. So if it doesn't explicitly prohibit it, then it's okay. In other words, if, if there is no thou shall not, then it means that it must be okay. So how do you think about that? Like, what do you do with this? 
It's true, the Bible never specifically says, thou shall not abort children. Why doesn't it say it? I'll give you a couple of things to think about. One, it was completely unthinkable to ancient Hebrews. Completely unthinkable to ancient Hebrews. God's promises to the Jewish people in the Old Testament hinged on two things, children and land. Right? Your descendants will get this land and you will live and you will rest and you will be my people. And so the idea of destroying children to ancient Hebrew people was unthinkable. Listen at Genesis 13, 14. This one's not going to be on the screen. We're going to get to some in just a second that are. But listen to what, what the Lord says to Abram, who will later become Abraham. Genesis 13, 14. I think actually this goes down through like verse 20, but you can write it down. Genesis 13, 14. It says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring as the, as the dust of the earth. So that if one can count the dust of the earth, so your offspring also can be counted. Arise and walk through the length and the breast of the land, for I'm about to give it to you. Land, children. Old Testament Hebrew would have never intentionally killed their own child. And if you fast forward up to the prophets, you'll see that when the nation is in decline and when God is about to bring judgment, they have begun to sacrifice their born children. And it's then, that's one of those tripping points where God says, judgment is coming. God didn't have to say it because they would never have thought about it. But just because it isn't explicitly prohibited, does that mean God approves, right? The Bible doesn't explicitly prohibit identity theft or computer hacking or discrimination against African Americans or lynching people. Does that mean Jesus is okay with that? No. I mean, think about it. You can't, you can't live this way. Uh, and people that, that would put forth kind of this line of thinking, you can't live this way. Let me give you a simple illustration. Right. I have kids. Lots of you have kids. Have you ever explicitly told them you cannot chop your sister's leg off with a hatchet? That's one I've never told my kids. Okay? Though it's been told now, right? You can't chop your sister's leg off with a hatchet. Then it must be okay though, right? Because I've never explicitly said it and you're like, uh, no. Everybody knows, right? How do you figure that out? Well, I've told my family, right? You're supposed to love your sister. And if you can't hit her with your fist, which I've said, or a stuffed animal, which I've said, or a toy bat, which I've also said, you probably can't hit her with an ax either. Right? God says it in other ways, right? Scripture clearly tells us that God is the creator of life very rarely does he destroy it, and not without great reason. And that humans are made in God's image, and children are a blessing, and that a child is a child, whether it's in the womb or outside of the womb, and killing the innocent is wrong. And God is especially concerned with the protection of the vulnerable. In the Old Testament, primarily widows and orphans and immigrants. And that Jesus loved children and routinely pulled them in around him. And that ultimately life is victorious over death. Right? You cannot, church, you cannot pick this book up and read it from beginning to end and walk away with the idea that God would be okay with the unjustified killing of innocent human beings. You cannot do it. Full stop. The only way you can do it is to open it up to a particular spot and try to rip a verse or a little passage out of its context and warp it and use it to try to justify yourself. That's the only thing you can do. But it fails the basic Bible interpretation test of what does the verse say? This is what I think it says. What does that say within the context of the passage that it's in? Does it still work? Yes, okay, you're good. What does it mean within the chapter? Does it still work? Yes, you're good. Does it work within the context of the book, like Matthew? Yes, you're still okay. What about the context of the Gospels or the New Testament or the entire Bible? If any of those answers are ever no, go back to the beginning and start over again because you've misinterpreted the verse, right? 
The story of the Bible is a story of life and creation and preservation and recreation. I'm going to give you some passages. You can write these down. I'm going to read them. They'll be up on the screen. Sometimes I'm going to have to flip because I ran out of ribbon markers. I only have three. Genesis 1, 26 through 31. God said, let us make man or human beings in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Right? Human beings, we are created in God's image. Male and female, from the beginning. Flip to Genesis chapter 4. Just a few pages over. Adam and Eve are not expelled from the garden. Chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 1, then I'm going to jump to verse 17. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. Okay, that's one of those Bible words for, you know. And she conceived. (laughs) It's like... What do you throw out there, right? We still got some kids in the room. Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. She conceived Cain, and she bore Cain. Cain was Cain when she conceived him, and Cain was Cain when she bore him. He was still Cain. We do the same thing. We get pregnant. What do we do? We name the child before he's ever born, right? Skip over to verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Enoch was Enoch when she conceived him, and Enoch was Enoch when he was born. There's no difference. Genesis 25. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 23. We've now jumped forward to the birth of Esau and Jacob. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Isaac, excuse me, Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old. I'm going to have to get my glasses here. I'm trying to avoid it, but I'm getting there. And Isaac was 40 years old, and he took Rebekah and the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she says, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. God had plans for these two embryos and fetuses before they were ever born. Right, just like he does for every human being. Psalm 139. This one's probably familiar. I'm going to read verses 13 through 16. The psalmist is talking to God. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed to me, when as of yet was none of them. God knits us together in there. He knows each and every one by name. God cares for the vulnerable. James chapter 1, verse 17. Here's where I got to start flipping. Excuse me, James chapter 1, verse 27. The vulnerable have a special place. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God cares for the vulnerable. Vulnerable children, vulnerable women. Psalm 82, jumping backwards. Psalm 82, verses 2 through 4. You should probably just write these down. You can come back and read them later. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. God protects those that are most vulnerable. 
Jesus loved kids. Listen to what he says about them in Matthew chapters 19 and 18. 19, verse 13 through 15. Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he went away. Loved them. Earlier in Matthew, Matthew records Jesus saying, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. You pull all this together, guys. The unborn are loved sons and daughters of God. We know that God loves all of his children, the born and the unborn. And we know it's not okay to whack your sister in the leg with a hatchet. We know that the unborn, right, it's the same. The Bible is as clear as the science textbook. And the church has recognized it clearly up until around a few decades ago. One of my favorite books. How Christianity Has Changed the World by a guy named, uh, I'll put this one up here. You can come look at it in a minute if you like. How Christianity Has Changed the World by Alvin Schmidt. Uh, It's about 15 years old now. It's all the rage today uh, to kind of rag on the church and basically blame, you know, Christianity for all the problems our society has in it. Uh, Even among some Christians, right? It's kind of the thing to do, but it's especially true among non-Christians often. This book does a great job of showing how Christianity and the church really built everything that those same people that are ragging on it actually value. The world we live in right, is defined by the Christian worldview, even for secular people, though they don't see it. So in here, uh, it's talking about, and I'm going to listen to this, page 49, right? It goes through all kinds of stuff. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, sanctification of human life. Uh, women receive freedom and dignity, right? Charity and compassion. Hospitals and health care. Christianity's imprint on education, right? Uh, Liberty and justice for all. Slavery is abolished. Christianity stamp on art and architecture. It's a pretty fascinating book, but I want to read just one short passage to you on chapter 2, The Sanctification of Life, page 49. It says, one way that Christianity underscored the sanctity of human life was its consistence and active opposition to the widespread pagan practice of infanticide, killing newborn infants usually soon after birth. Frederick Farrar has noted that infanticide was infamously universal among Greeks and Romans during the early years of Christianity. Infants were killed for a variety of reasons. Those were born deformed or physically frail were especially prone to being willfully killed, often by drowning. Some were killed more brutally. For instance, Plutarch mentions the Carthaginians, say that fast five times, who says, offered up their own children, and those who had no children would buy little ones from the poor people and cut their throats as if there were so many lambs or young birds. Meanwhile, the mother stood by without a tear or without a moan. Cicero justified infanticide, at least for the deformed, by citing the ancient 12 tablets of Roman law where he says the deformed infants shall be killed. Even Seneca, whose moral philosophy was on a higher plane than that of his culture, says, we drown children at birth who are weakly and abnormal. So common was infanticide that Polybius, Blame the population decline in ancient Greece on it. Large families were rare in Greco-Roman society, in part because of infanticide. Infant girls were especially vulnerable. For instance, in ancient Greece, it was rare for even a wealthy family to raise more than one daughter. An inscription at Delphi reveals that one second century sample of 600 families had only 1% who raised two daughters. And it goes on to talk about as you continue through the book, right, the Christian opposition to child abandonment and to infanticide resulted in laws outlawing the practice throughout Europe, along with outlawing infanticide, which had the wholesome effect of morally and legally ascribing to newborn infants the sanctity of life. Keeps going, right? The church has stood in the gap for children. Orphanages, as you know them, were started by Christians. You know, so many people, I bet, that have godparents. A practice done by non-Christians, started by Christians. Why? Because if the parents died, someone else had to take care of them. 
over and over and over again. The church has a long history of protecting vulnerable children. Have we always done it perfectly? No. This is kind of that point where, kind of leading into to the second half of this, but where, where are we, right? What have we learned today? Not the second half of what I'm talking about today, but what we'll get into next week. We've learned, right? Science tells us that the unborn are human beings. That reason tells us that the unborn are valuable human persons. That scripture tells us the unborn are loved, the sons and daughters of God. And that history tells us that the church has protected the vulnerable. Now, what would Jesus say, right? What would Jesus say today, thinking through all that to someone considering? I don't know. I'm basing this on my instant in the Bible, but I think he would say something like this. He'd say, I know you're scared, and I know the future seems uncertain, and I know you don't know what you're going to do, and I know the future seems tough, I am with you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Don't hurt your child. I am with you and I will help you. What would he say to someone that perhaps is looking back on one. I think Jesus would look them in the eye and say, my dear child, I love you. I love you more than you can possibly know. And you are not beyond my grace and my forgiveness. Come to me, rest from your burden, take my yoke upon you, it's gentle, and you'll find rest for your soul. I think Jesus would say to those who would condemn her, let the one who is among you without sin cast the first stone. And then look and ask, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Our world needs truth and it needs grace when it comes to this topic. And even though I know it kind of feels like we're stopping right in the middle here, This is what we're angling for. How do we deal with this topic gracefully and truthfully? We'll pick it up again next week. I'm going to pray for us. And then I've got a little bit more to say as I kind of wrap up. Dear Jesus, we pray your grace and your mercy upon each and every one of us. It's Fourth of July weekend as as we celebrate uh, the anniversary of the birth of our country. We recognize that it has not always done right by everyone. Lord, we pray for its future. We pray for our future. We pray for those that, that uh, are, are dealing with this and thinking about it and turmoil about it. We pray for uh, the discussions that are going on. We pray for us, for in this room, that you would clear our minds. Help us to understand what it is you would have us to know and send us out as ambassadors and witnesses. We pray all this in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So if you look up uh, on the front table, like I said, I got a, a couple other things to say before I wrap up. You'll notice a number of books. Uh, here's my kind of my verbal footnote. I drew heavily from all of those in, in what I was saying today. So I want to invite you and kind of tell you a little bit about each one of them. But if you pick one up and start reading, you may be like, ah, oh, that looks familiar. Yes, like I said, I drew heavily from each one of those. Where I quoted directly, I quoted directly and attributed. But uh, the one kind of in the middle here, Scott Klusendorf's The Case for Life is fantastic. Probably the one that has influenced me the most. Works its way through the, the idea of, of the logic of You know, what are the unborn, then works into the biblical case, then goes into the answering of some objections. I'll use it very heavily next week, so you can come look at it, but you can't take it. Uh, Defending Life by Francis Beckwith is also very good. Pro-Life Answers to Pro-Choice Arguments by Randy Alcorn is fantastic. It's just a long 
uh, kind of anthology of answers, How Christianity Changed the World by Alvin Schmidt. And then the SLED acronym, uh, I actually pulled from an article uh, which I've printed out about 50 or 60 copies. So you can take one of those if you like that walks through in a little bit more detail what I said. Though as you read through it, you'll be like, ah, that looks familiar. Yes, because I drew very heavily from what he had to say. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about how do you have grace-filled conversations around this, okay? And then we're going to move into, right, what's the future look like for, for the church, for us as, pertins, as, pertins, as persons, uh, and then just kind of moving out into the wider culture, okay? All right, I'll be up here. If you have questions, comments, concerns, you can always come talk to me. You can call me, text me, email me. Uh, I'm always available. But God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you, and the Lord give you his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next time.